Hey everybody, it's Brian, and I'm going to put forward four statements about Canada, and I want you to pick out the false one. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. Number one, Santa Claus is officially a Canadian citizen. Number two, Canada was the first country in the world to create a landing pad specifically for UFOs. Number three, Canada consumes more mac and cheese than any other country in the world. And number four, Canadians are so polite and apologize so often that the Canadian government passed an Apology Act, making apologies inadmissible in court cases. Okay, I'm sorry. You know what? I think I need to take a Canadian moment here to apologize because, as it turns out, none of those four statements is false. They're all completely true, and more distinctly Canadian than anything I could ever make up, which should give you some idea of the fun we're in for as we begin our geographical study of America's dear old friend to the north. Canada, as we mentioned before, is the second largest country in the world by area, and we know that it shares a variety of physical characteristics with the United States. It's also got water. A lot of water. In fact, Canada has 20% of the world's freshwater supply and 9% of the world's renewable freshwater resources. That fresh water is just one of the many things for which Canada is well known. In fact, so much of what makes it famous is its land. The sheer size and openness and beauty of Canada is at times an awe-inspiring spectacle for the human eye. Canada is a huge country, covering 3.86 million square miles of the northern half of North America, just barely beating the USA's size of 3.8 million square miles. As we've learned before, it shares a lot of physical characteristics with the U.S., but as we've also discussed, Canada is very much its own nation, with its own distinct cultures and challenges and natural beauty. Canada has more lakes than any other country in the world, and some of them just about take your breath away and may make you ask, can this be real? 30% of Canada's land is covered with trees. Those forests and the land on which they stand tall can be broken down into 10 provinces and 3 territories, which in turn can be broken down into 5 distinct regions. Each of those regions possesses its own physical characteristics, cultural characteristics, and unique economies. Today, we'll look at some of those. In the southeastern corner of Canada are the Atlantic provinces, the smallest of Canada's region, including only about 5% of its land and about 8% of its people. As you can see, all of them border the Atlantic Ocean. They are Newfoundland and Labrador, Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick. As you probably know, this region is also part of the Appalachian Mountain Range that extends from Alabama and Georgia in the U.S. South region up through the eastern United States until ending in Canada. This area is covered with mixed deciduous forest, rugged terrain, and thousands of lakes and ponds. The thin soil is full of rocks and boulders, and along with the cool climate, makes this area in places somewhat unsuitable for farming particular crops. However, the Atlantic provinces have plenty to offer. They're also known as the Maritimes, or Maritime Provinces, because of their strong links to the Atlantic Ocean. Maritime means related to the sea, and most people in this region live along the coast. Hundreds of bays and inlets dominate these provinces, and the cities and towns along the coast, providing harbors for fishing boats and a living for many of its residents. The Atlantic provinces have historically played a vital role in Canada's settlement and development but changes in the economic structure have occurred over the years. The Grand Banks off the coast of Newfoundland and Nova Scotia were once one of the world's richest fishing areas, but years of overfishing depleted it so severely that Canada suspended cod fishing in the Grand Banks in 1992. The move destroyed many fishing-related industries in the region, forcing a scramble among those who depend on the sea. Many successfully switched to harvesting shrimp and crab from the ocean and its bays. 
Forestry and farming have become more important to the area over the last century. Climate and soil permitting, which isn't always the case, people here grow fruit trees, vegetables, and run dairy farms. Perhaps the most successful agricultural endeavors in the Maritimes can be found on Prince Edward Island, which is well suited to farming with its rolling hills and fertile soil, and a milder climate which allows a longer growing season than the mainland provinces. Meanwhile, many maritime residents have found work in emerging industries such as tourism and oil production. Despite the hardships related to fishing, the region's economy is on the rise. Central Canada is made up entirely of the provinces of Ontario and Quebec. These two provinces are where the majority of Canadians live. In fact, more than 60% of Canada's 38 million people live in these two provinces. Ontario alone is home to 38% of Canada's population. Ontario includes Toronto, Canada's largest city and primary hub of economic activity, and home to almost 2.8 million Canadians. Though much smaller, Toronto is sometimes referred to as Canada's New York City for its importance to the Canadian economy. Another 23% of Canada's 38 million people live in Quebec, the predominantly French-speaking province which includes Montreal, central Canada's second largest city with a population of about 1.7 million. Central Canada includes three distinct landscapes. First is the Canadian Shield, which is notable for poor soil, a cold climate, and rich mineral deposits which we talked about in another lesson. Next, we have the Hudson Bay Lowlands, which are flat, swampy, and sparsely populated, located between the Canadian Shield and the Hudson Bay. Finally, Central Canada includes the St. Lawrence Lowlands, marked by rich soil, a mild climate, and more than 60% of the nation's population, to which we referred earlier. This area is located around the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River Valley. Benefiting from a location central to Canada, Ontario is blessed with excellent waterways, which greatly augment the transportation of resources and the goods produced from them. The St. Lawrence Seaway connects the Great Lakes to the St. Lawrence River, which is often called Canada's Highway to the Sea. Due to the deep reach of the waterway into the Canadian landmass, large amounts of products are shipped both in and out of it. The connectivity from the St. Lawrence to the Great Lakes is important as well. It's easy to think of the Great Lakes as a sort of flat, homogenous area when you look at them on a map. But the five lakes are actually very different from each other in elevation. Lake Superior is at the highest elevation, 600 feet above sea level, while Lake Ontario is the lowest at about 245 feet above sea level. The St. Lawrence Waterway has locks to make up the difference in elevation and help freights make the journey. A lock is an enclosed area on a canal that raises or lowers ships from one water level to another. The St. Lawrence Waterway also includes a hydroelectric dam, jointly constructed by the U.S. and Canada, to provide power and take advantage of the different elevations. Ontario has both rich soil and an abundance of mineral resources underneath it. The southern part of the province is farmed heavily, mostly grains such as soybeans and corn. This area is also where most of the people of Ontario live. Southern Ontario includes a network of cities, including Toronto and Ottawa, the capital of Canada. Ontario is also highly industrial and is the home of manufacturing and distribution of cars, food products, clothing, and building materials. Stimulating that industrial progress is the fact that it's easy to ship products from there on the various waterways we've talked about. Oh yeah, the Canadian side of Niagara Falls also borders Ontario, though it's not one of those waterways used for transporting goods. Within the Toronto metropolitan area, which is the biggest in Canada by a large margin, by the way, is located one-third of Canada's largest companies and their main offices. Remember when we mentioned earlier that Toronto is the hub of Canadian economic activity? Toronto is where Canada's banking and financial centers are located. Meanwhile, Ottawa is located on the Ottawa River across from Hull, Quebec, which together make up Canada's fourth largest metropolitan area. Quebec is Canada's largest province by land area, over 595,000 square miles, but most of its people live in the cities and around the St. Lawrence River Valley. Few people live on the Canadian Shield, which covers the northern 80% of the province of Quebec. 
most of that area has remained wilderness, lush forests, clear rivers, and beautiful, if occasionally frozen, lakes. Back down in the southern portion around Montreal, the Appalachian Mountains line the border. Both the Southeast and the Canadian Shield are centers for primary economic activities such as mining and forestry. Farming is important in the fertile plains of the St. Lawrence Valley, particularly various grains and products such as maple syrup. However, many residents have been lured from the countryside into the cities looking for manufacturing and service jobs and a more steady paycheck. Many of those people end up in Montreal. Quebec's biggest city, Montreal, is often described as uniquely beautiful due to its combination of old-world European and modern architecture. Founded in 1642 and located on the St. Lawrence River, Montreal grew up after hosting Expo 67, the World's Fair, and then the Summer Olympics only nine years later. Some of these structures from those events, such as the Montreal Biosphere, are still there. The city was transformed into an urban center that remains a combination of historic charm and contemporary flair which make it a tourist favorite. Quebec City is the oldest city in Canada, founded in 1608 by Samuel de Champlain, who was sent by France to establish a colony. Capital of the Quebec province, Quebec City provides a combination of historic sites and European charm that is popular with tourists. As the center of Canada's French-speaking population, Montreal, Quebec City, and the rest of the province maintain a distinctly different culture than much of the rest of Canada. For example, about 78% of the Canadian population speaks English as a first language. The 22% who speak predominantly French? We, oui, they live here in Quebec. The province also includes a political party, the Bloc Québécois, based almost entirely in Quebec, which seeks independent sovereignty from Canada. That's right, they want to be their own nation. Small but influential, the Bloc Québécois, as of 2021, had almost 10% of the representation in the Canadian House of Commons, which is the nation's elected legislature. As we wrap up today's lesson on Central Canada and the Atlantic provinces, continue to look both for similarities and differences between the United States and its neighbor to the north. In so many ways, the two are strikingly alike. While in many others, the U.S. and Canada are vastly different. Regardless, the future of these two countries will continue to intertwine as it has for centuries. Until next time, keep exploring! Hey, hey.